Hey, what is up, 1440? We are still getting armored up. You know, got the got the helmet and the shield and all, you know, all the good stuff that the Hanleys have been talking about. You know, we even had Pastor John drop in for a week. So here we are, week seven, Armor of God, 1440. Throw it to the Hanleys. Let's go. Welcome back, 1440. This is part two of our Spin the Wheel Challenge or the Challenge Wheel, some might say. This week, I have Jess with me. How you feeling? Good. So let's see what the wheel has for her today. All right, you got a New Testament question, okay? I'm going to read you a scripture and you've got to tell me what the scripture is. The book, chapter, and verse, okay? For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes the thing he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. What is this scripture? Mark 4. Sixteen. Mark 4.16 is incorrect. It is Mark 11.23. Well, Jess, you're getting pied in the face. <laughs> All right. not been he in here for any part of the series. I think this is week like seven maybe. <laughs> I think this is week seven <coughs> um, of this series on the armor of God. How many of you have heard of the armor of God before? Most of us. If you did not raise your hand just now, you definitely have heard of it because you've heard of it uh, the last six weeks. Me and Pastor Holden and Pastor John have been preaching it. Praise the Lord. Um, but I, uh, we, we decided to do these, this series, and I believe we were led of the Lord to do this series, because this time of year, there is always a lot of attention on the things of the Spirit. And when I say the things of the Spirit, I don't mean just mean the things of the Holy Spirit, but I mean spiritual things in general, right? October is Halloween, um, and pretty much everywhere you go, you turn on the TV, you walk into Walmart, and you, you, or you drive down the street in your neighborhood, right? And there is a bunch of hoopla about the kingdom of darkness. And how many of you know that just as real as God is, the devil is just as real? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Um, and uh, the things of darkness and the kingdom of, of, of Satan is a real thing. Amen. Amen. Um, and the devil is on a mission to steal from you, to kill you, and to destroy you. And so many people, especially in your generation, live their lives day in, day out, week in, week out, totally unaware that they have an enemy out to get them. Just like totally unaware. They don't, whether, whether they, a lot of people believe in God, but forget that they are engaging in a spiritual warfare. Uh, but majority of the world doesn't even believe that God is real. Doesn't even believe that God exists. And so we see that most of the world is cloaked and covered in darkness and in deception. And that is the number one way that the enemy operates is through deception. We know that the devil has been stripped of all of his power, amen? That he has no power, he has no authority, he has no access, he has no foothold in your life except for that power and access and foothold that you give him, amen? He cannot come and possess you and make you sin, right? right. It's not, you can't tell your mom if you get busted lying like, oh, the devil like possessed me and made those words come out of my mouth, mom. I, I didn't say that. I don't know what was happening, right? No, you on, on your own accord and on your own authority choose to yield to te the, the temptation of the enemy and therefore defer your authority to him. 
but the devil himself has been stripped of all of his authority and has been rendered powerless ever since Jesus died and was crucified on the cross and rose again from the dead and he went to hell and he defeated Satan for you so that you could live your life victorious, so that you could live your life prosperous, so that you could live your life healthy, so that you could live your life whole, so that you could live your life happy, so that you could have a healthy relationships. You're not called to live in a place of dysfunction all of the time so that you could have good grades. Amen. This is why Jesus, what Jesus purchased for you and you as young believers, as young Christians and uh, as young soldiers in the army of God need to be aware that you have armor to stand up against the strategies and the tactics of the devil. Amen. 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 Now notice um, let's, uh, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. First Timothy chapter six, verse 12. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were summoned and for which you confessed the good confession of faith before many witnesses. So from this verse, we know that we are engaged in a fight. Amen. He doesn't say if you want to fight the good fight of faith or every now and then when you feel like it, fight the good fight of faith. He says, you are fighting a fight. But how many of you know it's a good fight? Why is it a good fight? Because you win. You already won. Amen. You know the end from the beginning. You know how it all turns out. And if you put these principles in the word of God to work for you, you know that you will end up standing at the end of every battle. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 6 this is what I want to make note of. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, starting in verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Other translations would say strategies of the devil. Maybe another translation would say tactics of the devil. But do you know what that word is not? It doesn't say power of the devil. Because the devil doesn't have any power over you or in your life. Amen. Amen. The whole church said, amen. Amen. Praise God. So we know that this is a fight that we're fighting, that it's a good fight. It's a fight that we've already been in the, that we've already won the victory. But here's the question. Why do you still have to fight it then? If Jesus already won the battle, why do you still have to fight? Have you all ever thought about that? It's because you live in a fallen world. Amen. Amen. Um, You live in a world, the Bible says, the prince of darkness is the prince of this world. Um, And all you have to do is walk down the hallway of your public school to know it. Amen. Um, And for, you know, I, I heard Keith Moore say one time, he had a lady come up to him and she said, Brother Keith, I just, I'm not a fighter. Like, I don't want to fight. I'm, a, I'm just not a fighter. Like, that's not in my nature. And Brother Keith said, well, then you're a loser. <laughs> like, dang. Wow. Right? right? But why? Because if you choose not to fight, you'll lose. Yeah. And here's another deceptive, deceptive lie of the enemy. The enemy would like for you to believe that you can just not fight and still win. And a lot of Christians think they don't have to do anything. They don't have to activate their faith. They don't have to use their faith. They don't have to um, resist anything or stand firm against anything because Jesus has already won my battle. Well, you know what? You can sit there and praise God and ask God to break every chain. There's power in the name of Jesus and get your Tasha Cobbs on, right? But you you will sing yourself blue in the face unless you're willing to put the principles of God to work in your life. It's the word of God in your life, in your mouth, and through your actions that breaks the chains off of your life, not a worship song. So we have to understand that we are fighting a fight and that we have to choose to fight or else we lose. And there's nothing sadder than a Christian who's defeated. And I see defeated Christians all the time. I grew up in a dead, whitewashed, liturgical church, denominational church. Totally void of the move of the spirit. 
And I, I thank God that I had, uh, my dad was a Rama grad. He went to Rama and came up under Brother Hagen and Keith Moore. And I had that instilled in me at home, praise the Lord. But there are, I heard Brother Keith say this one time. He said, um, most people in the world are either dead or asleep. Most people in the world are either spiritually dead because they don't know God as their savior at all, or they're asleep, which means maybe they've asked Jesus to be their savior, but he's not their Lord. And there are two very different things. Why do you think it is that we declare that Jesus is Lord at the end of every service we have? That's not just some cute little tagline we decided to start saying. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Jesus being your savior means he redeemed you from hell and you gave your life to him and you believe that he exists. But Jesus being your Lord means that he has the final say in every area of your life. Amen. Amen. And um, we have to come to a place where we decide if Jesus is really Lord, um, then we are going to be awake to that reality. And there are a lot of Christians in the church who are sleeping. They're defeated. They've been beat up. They've, they, they've accepted lies, religious lies, saying, oh, well, cancer is from God because he's trying to teach you something. Or, you know, God is just silent sometimes. He's not silent. God is speaking all the time. He put, he put his spirit, the Bible says that the spirit the, and, the, and the love and the light of God has been shed abroad in your heart, right? That the word of God is alive and active. God's not dead. He's not silent. He's not um, abstinent. He's not far off from you. And so many people are dead in their faith and dead in their religion because they may believe God exists, but they don't have an active, living, breathing relationship with him as their Lord. So we have to understand that as we engage in this spiritual fight, that this is not, um, this is not optional. Yeah. If you've committed to living a Christian life, it's not an optional fight for you. You will either fight and win or you will choose not to fight and lose. Yeah. Because either way, the enemy's coming after you. Now, we know we have nothing to be afraid of. That's not to instill fear in you that there's going to be a devil around every corner, right? Even in practical, a practical sense, when, when a country is fighting a war, they're not fighting literally 24-7, yeah. right? They have battles, appointed times of, of fighting, right? So it doesn't mean that you're going to be fighting nonstop every waking moment of every day and every night. But what it does mean is there are going to be seasons of your life that are battle seasons, Seasons of your life where the enemy is coming against you and you have to decide and you have to know ahead of time how to stand and how to fight back. Amen? And as your youth pastor, I am not gonna see this youth group get beat up by the devil. Amen? Amen? Amen. And that's why we're doing this series. Because it's important that you know how to fight. That you know what tools God has made available to you already in the spirit for you to fight back and fight effectively. Right? I used to have a sermon illustration. Tonight we're talking about the, um, the uh, sword of the spirit. And uh, I used to have this sermon illustration where I'd get a sword like this. It's kind of heavy. Y'all didn't even know this was up here, did you? Um, I'd get a sword like this and I'd get a butter knife. And if I sent you into battle with a butter knife, you'd be like, uh, Pastor Catherine, how do, you want me, how do you expect me to do anything with this butter knife? And if I told you to make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with this sword, <laughs> you probably also have an equally difficult time, right? Why? Because those are two very effective tools, right? Two very effective tools, but used for two very different things. Uh, and, and Oral Roberts used to say, we need to learn how to use our faith like a mechanic uses a tool, which means that we, know, we need to know how to accurately uh, divide and discern the word of truth. We need to know how to accurately employ these weapons of our warfare against the enemy. You have to know which weapon is needed at the time. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So we are at the end of the list. We've talked about um, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. I had a whole page just to recap those. Um, but for sake of time and what I feel like the Lord is wanting me to say, I'm not going to recap those. Um, but we've been learning how to effectively use each of those pieces of armor. Amen? Amen. 
your, your helmet of salvation, your shield of faith. Uh, that wasn't a pizza pan shield, right? It, it actually, Roman shields were, were more like doors, about six feet tall, big, rectangular, covered their whole body. Pastor Holden preached, I think it was last week, about how you have been given enough faith to cover every area of your life. Just like that shield would cover every area of a Roman soldier's body. You've been given shoes of peace. We talked about how peace is an offensive weapon. Peace isn't just the absence of chaos, but peace is actually so forceful and so powerful that it can take chaos by the throat and cast it down. When Jesus calmed the storm and he said, peace be still, peace surged into that storm, grabbed the wind, grabbed the waves, waves grabbed the rain, and, and I mean, that, that sea went to like still, still like glass in an instant. That is how forceful and strong peace is. Amen. Amen. And we talked about how the Bible says you have to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The word shod is a weird word, but in the Greek, it actually means to be fitted tightly. And I used an example. I had Ava Clark um, wear, uh, who was it? Uh, Turner's shoes and try to run a lap around the room. And I think she made it like four steps before her shoes fell off. <laughs> And we realize that if your shoes don't fit, you're not very effective. And that means if peace isn't tightly secured to every area of your life, the enemy is going to have access to rob peace from you. Amen. Shoes of peace. Helmet of salvation. Pastor John talked about that. How the helmet was flashy. It was the most noticeable thing about a Roman soldier. And likewise, your salvation should be the most noticeable thing about you. That when you walk down the hallway, you shouldn't be trying to hide that you're a Christian. You shouldn't try to be trying to hide at work with the people you work with that you're different. Boys, you don't need to be talking about sex and women in a degrading way just because all the other guys around you are doing it. You don't need to be looking at nonsense on your phone like everybody else. You don't need to be doing all the TikTok trends that have cussed words in them like everybody else. You don't need to be looking like everybody else, but rather that helmet of salvation is actually meant to dis be on display for everyone to see and people should want to be like you. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Helmet of salvation, shoes of peace, shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness. This will combat any ounce of insecurity in the room. You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's nothing that you can do to earn it. And that righteousness, that knowing that you are in right standing with God and that there's nothing that you could ever do, nothing that hell could ever do to separate you from the love of God, it guards your heart. That breastplate would guard every vital organ of that soldier's body. And likewise, your righteousness, knowing that you have been made the righteousness of God and knowing the authority that you have in him will protect protect everything vital in your life. Amen. Praise God. And that brings us to the sword of the spirit. <laughs> so picking back up in Ephesians chapter six, it says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, so it's saying you're fighting this fight. It's not a fist fight. It's not a physical fight. It is a faith fight. Amen. And while you may not actually wrestle in the flesh, in the natural, you are fighting all the time. Raise your hand if you've ever been tempted. You're fighting. Raise your hand if you've been tempted today. You're fighting. Raise your hand if you were tempted multiple times today to say something you shouldn't have, to back talk your mom, to slap your brother across the head, what have you, right? We are continually fighting this fight of faith. Amen? Amen. And so it says, because we're continually fighting this fight, it says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Right? We talked about the belt of truth week one. That truth is what holds everything else together. If you don't believe what the word of God says, then righteousness won't do you any good. If you don't believe what the word of God says, then your salvation's not authentic. If you don't believe what the word of God says, then peace isn't available to you. Amen? So the, the truth, standing on the truth, 
right? Not, truth is not subjective like everybody in the world wants you to, to think it is. It's not his truth, her truth, my truth, your truth. I'm just telling my truth. I'm living my truth. It is the truth. And if it doesn't line up with the book and his words, then it's not true. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Yeah. Simple as that. So it says, having uh, girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of, pe of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. So the sword of the spirit, the, the Bible, don't you love when the Bible gives you the answer? Yeah. It tells you what the sword of the spirit is. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Amen. And while all these other pieces of armor that we've talked about in this series, your helmet, your breastplate, your shoes, your shield, your belt, all of these other pieces of armor are deep and primarily defensive. They're meant to be worn for your protection. But what I love about the sword of the spirit it is, is that it, it is a primarily offensive weapon. It is meant to do some damage. Amen. So I'm going to read this excerpt to you from Rick Renner from his book. It's called Dress to Kill. It's amazing. It's like 600 pages, and he goes real nerdy on <coughs> all, the, um, <clears throat> all the different pieces of armor and their significance, and I mean, it's amazing. But I just want to read you this one part about the sword. He says, the word for sword, as used in this text, is taken from the Greek word makaira. This brutal weapon of murder, a Makaira sword, was approximately 19 inches long. Both sides of its blade were razor sharp, making this sword much more dangerous than the other four. There were five different types of Roman swords that the Roman soldiers would use. It says, in addition, the tip of the sword turned upward, causing the point of the blade to be extremely sharp and deadly. This two-edged blade inflicted a wound far worse than any of the other swords. Before a Roman soldier withdrew this particular sword from the gut of his enemy, he would hold his sword very tightly with both hands and give it a wrenching twist inside of his enemy's stomach. This would cause the opponent's entrails to spill out as the soldier pulled the sword from his enemy's body. Of all the swords available, this Machaira sword was the most dangerous of all. Although the other swords were deadly, this one was a terror to the imagination. The sword was not only intended to kill, but to completely rip an enemy's insides to shreds. It was a weapon of murder. Because Paul used the word makaira in Ephesians chapter 6, 17 to describe our sword of the spirit, he declares that God has given the church a weapon that is just that brutal against the enemy. This weapon called the sword of the spirit has the potential to rip our foe to shreds. Amen. 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 This is the intention that God had for his word. The use of the word of God in the hand of a believer is to do utter damage to the kingdom of darkness. Amen. So turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter one. We're gonna talk about the word a little bit. I'm gonna read out the New King James Version. You guys may know this well. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So what is the word? It's him. It's, it's his very essence. He is his word. He can't be separated from his word. That is who God is. God is his word. Amen? Amen. And it says, he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, I know that was like a perfect soda can pop. I love it. Um, I know that, that saying that the darkness couldn't comprehend the light, that's not exactly a phrase that makes you want to like shout and clap and run around the room, right? Like the darkness did not comprehend it. It's like, okay, great. Like 
you know, the word comprehend almost makes you go, hmm, okay, didn't comprehend it. Like, sounds kind of educational, right? But another word for this, another word for the term comprehend actually means overtake. So what this verse is actually saying is it's saying that the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overtake the light. Now that should make you get a little bit more excited, but I'm about to tell you why. I heard Keith Moore say this. He said, you know, if there was a train station right next door to the chapel and this train pulled up next to the chapel doors over here and we had 15 cars full of vacuum sealed pitch black darkness and we decided we were gonna unload that darkness into the chapel, you would never know it. Why? Because if I open that door to let the darkness in and there's light in here, what happens? You never know the darkness existed because of the presence of the light. Amen? Amen. And that's what this this verse is saying. It's saying that the light of the word of God, this sword of light that you have been given is so powerful that when darkness comes into his presence, darkness doesn't even, it's not like you turn on your bedroom light in the morning and like the darkness just like kind of recoils a few feet and then the light and the dark start to wrestle and you're like, oh, I really hope the light wins today because I need to get ready, right? Like when you turn on the light, you know that the darkness disappears, amen? Amen, Amen. Amen. there is no, they're not rivals. And I love that song, it says, you have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign because God is not wrestling with the enemy. And we're not sitting here wondering, oh, who's going to win, light or dark, God or the devil, good or evil. We know that darkness cannot overcome, cannot overtake the light, and that that light is a weapon of our warfare. And that means if the light of God is in you, the devil cannot overtake you. Amen. 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 Now turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> We're going to start in verse 3, talking about this sword of light. This, the word is light. Starting in verse 3, it says that the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil. It is only hidden from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord and we ourselves are your, are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light in darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. What is this verse saying? Verse six, it says that he has made that light and, that, and that, that power available to you. He shed it abroad in your heart to the degree that if the light of God is in you, can darkness exist? No. If the Bible says that the darkness cannot comprehend the light, it cannot overtake the light, that means if the light of God is in you, when you use the sword of the spirit, what happens? Darkness doesn't stand a chance. But I think it's interesting that this verse points out the way the rest of the world lives. And we see this now in 2022 more than ever. It says, Satan, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. Because the light of God is not in them, they are living in darkness. And that's what you have to remind yourself when you deal with that person at school or somebody who wants to mock you for what you believe or somebody who um, is living their life in total deception, right? Um, You can't argue with someone who believes a lie. Amen? Amen. If, If someone is convinced of a lie and they are living in deception, the Bible literally says that God has given them over to a depraved mind. It means they cannot even comprehend that they are deceived. And that's why we have to pray that we are used as the Bible says, the light of the world. 
right? To help people see the truth, to help people know the truth. But we are not called as believers to be compromised by the darkness. Okay, why am I harping on this so much? It's because it's part of who you are. And if you would grasp this, if you could understand this, you would, um, it would be a lot easier to stand against the people around you, right? There's a reason that Ephesians 6 says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Why would Paul even write that? Because people thought they were wrestling against flesh and blood. They thought other people were their problem. They think, people think Joe Biden is the problem. Your problem is not a person. Amen. Your problem is not a person. Amen. Your problem is not that mean girl at school. Your problem is not your parent. Your problem is not your teacher. Your problem is not um, a political figure or anything or anyone else. Your problem is a spiritual problem. And you have to understand that when you deal with people, you're dealing with people who have yielded themselves over to the spirit of darkness. And when you view it that way, it makes being a light a lot easier. Because you realize I'm not fighting with you I'm not trying to uh, uh, wrestle against you or combat with you. In fact, you know what? Darkness, when it comes into my presence, can't stay. I've heard Brother Jesse DePlanis tell sto this story multiple times. He talks about how he got on an airplane to fly somewhere. It was like a commercial flight. And some lady walked down the aisle, and the Holy Spirit said she's demon-possessed. And Brother Jesse's like, cool, God. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> like, like, I'm really, really glad you uh, brought that to my attention. And the Holy Spirit said, are you going to do anything about it? And he goes, nope. <laughs> like, he's like, I'm, I'm like 30,000 feet in the air, contained in a very con tight, small space. Like, what do you want me to do about it? And the, and and the Holy Spirit said, you're not going to cast the devil out of that woman? And he was like, no, Lord, I'm not. And he has this, this internal like, battle like, conversation with the Lord. And so he finally he was like, fine, I'll do it, but I'm not getting up from my seat. And he said that she was sitting like three or four rows back across the aisle from him. So he starts praying in tongues, casting the devil out of this lady, and she just starts convulsing. And like the, he hears the, the little ding, like the little flight attendant, like light go on. And the flight attendants are like bustling down the aisle and he's just sitting there. And this lady's like, they're like, help, we need a doctor. And brother Jesse, you know, he ends up getting up and praying for the lady. And then he tells the flight attendant that it was the devil. It was cast the devil out of her. And the flight attendants really freaked out. And everybody else on the flight was really freaked out. <laughs> But the point of the story, right, is that in that presence of light, darkness can't stand it. Amen. Dark. Why do you think there is such a demonic agenda? I'm going to get political because I'm not going to be political. I'm going to be biblical. Okay? Amen. Why do you think there's such a demonic agenda driving abortion? Why do you think there is so much hostility on social media right now between Republicans and Democrats? It's because the darkness cannot stand the light. Why do you think there was such, like people still can't get over Donald Trump and he hasn't been the president for two years. Like, and they're still like talking about him in the news because they can't, they can't get over how much they hate him. Why? Because the darkness hates the light. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, don't be surprised when the world hates you because of me. So if you fit in with the people around you, you're probably doing something wrong. I heard, a, I heard a story, Smith Wigglesworth, hadn't been, he's, he said that he hadn't been persecuted in like a week or something. Maybe it was only a few days. I don't remember the exact amount of time, but he had gone like several days without experiencing any kind of persecution. And he said the conviction of God was so heavy in his heart. He was like, Lord, like no one's, no one's like making fun of me for my faith. No one is like talking bad about me. <laughs> and he's like, I, might, I must be doing something wrong. And so I think this was, this was before cars and stuff. Uh, and, and I guess he was in like in a, in a horse-drawn like carriage type thing. And it says that he pulled over to the side of the road to pray and repent to the Lord for uh, whatever he was doing wrong to really seek God because he wasn't being persecuted. And he said, and, and he said that while he was kneel, knelt down on the side of the road, someone drove by or rode by on a horse and threw a brick at his head. And it was confirmation to him that, that from the Lord that he was doing something right, right? You know what Billy Graham said? You all ever heard of him? Yeah. Billy Graham said the thing that kept him up at night was why everybody liked him so much. You are called to be different. 
And you shouldn't be surprised when the world hates you because you wield a, a sword of light. You carry the word of God in your heart. If God is in you and you are in him, then the word is in you, right? Right? right. right. Amen. And that's gonna make people in the world very uncomfortable. John chapter three, verse 16. You guys know this verse, but have you ever kept reading? Yeah. I hope so. Do you guys know what John three seventeen says? Because if you read John 3, 16 so much that you just have it memorized, then you should definitely know what John 3, 17 and 18 and 19 say, right? John 3, chapter 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be through him might be saved. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Verse 19, this is what I want you to pay attention to. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. We know that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We know uh, from the verses we just read that the Word is light. And here the Bible says in verse 19 that Jesus is the light of the world because he is the Word. Amen? Amen. And it says the light that has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. People love darkness. I heard Brother Jesse Duplantis say this one time. He said, a lot of times people wear their chains as jewelry. Their victim mentality becomes so much a part of their identity. They love that it gives them attention. So they don't actually want to be set free from bondage. They don't want to be set free from addiction because they actually think it makes them glamorous. Why do you think uh, all this kind of sexual stuff is like so popular among celebrities? Why do you think every Super Bowl halftime show is a bunch of people grinding around on the stage for 30 minutes? Seriously. It's because people love darkness. And they they love um, their works of evil so much that even if they knew it was wrong, they still wouldn't reject it. The Bible says, for they, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates darkness the light, and does not come to the light because his deeds will be exposed. I can't tell you how many students in this youth group, I'm not gonna look at, make any eye contact with any of you individually, but how many students in this youth group have come to me and said, yeah, Pastor Catherine, I was going through this or I was struggling with this issue, but I didn't wanna tell you about it because I knew if I did, I knew what you would say and then I would actually be accountable to what you said. I've had people look me in the eyes and tell me that before. Meaning, I didn't want to tell you about my sin because I already knew it was wrong deep down, but if you said it out loud, then I'd actually have to be held accountable. I'm just going to leave that there. (laughs) People hate the light because the light exposes their sin. When the light comes on, I don't know if you've all ever been like, I heard, I, I'm just like full of Keith Moore stories tonight. I don't know why they're coming up in my spirit, but I'm just gonna tell, I heard Keith Moore say one time he went on a fishing trip and um, they had to use the restroom. And I guess that there was this <coughs> like nightclub down by the lake, um, but like a nightclub, like during the day, it's like not open, right? Um, and he said that he went into this nightclub to use the restroom and the lights were on. And he said it was literally the most filthy, disgusting, like, place he'd ever seen. But, like, it was packed out every night with people clubbing and dancing and listening to music uh, because when it was dark, they couldn't see how disgusting it was, right? But when you bring things into the light, that's why the enemy uses shame against the body of Christ so much. If you're in this room and you've got a pornography addiction, you need to talk to a pastor, You need to turn the light on because what the enemy wants you to do, this is part of his deceptive strategies, is to keep it in the dark. 
Don't let anybody know. If anybody knew this about you, they would think less of you. If anybody knew that you were struggling with that, uh, they would judge you. If you would get in trouble, think about what the consequences would be. They're gonna tell, everybody's gonna know, right? And all of those thoughts run through your mind to the point where he actually talks you into keeping things concealed in the dark when you're called to be a child of the light. This is all the word of God. This is all the sword of the spirit. This is how you use it against the enemy. You turn the light on on some things and you be a lover of the light, even if it means exposing some things in your own heart. Amen? Amen. But verse 21 says, he who does, does the truth, how many of you all wanna do the truth? You wanna know the truth. You wanna speak the truth. You wanna live the truth, the truth, the word of God. It says, he who does the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12, you guys don't have to turn there, but I wanna read it to you. It says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. Don't be upset when he corrects you. Is this the year of correction? Yes. And yet the Bible says multiple times throughout scripture, we're called to love correction. How many of y'all love being corrected? All right, you guys are like, maybe lying, maybe telling the truth, I don't know. <laughs> but to your flesh, correction doesn't feel good, right? To your flesh, like getting in trouble, God correcting you, your boss correcting you, your parents correcting you, your teacher correcting you, it doesn't feel good. But yet the Bible says to love correction. Why? Because correction brings light. Amen. Correction brings light. Correction exposes darkness. Amen. Praise God. I'm on page four out of seven and I have five minutes. <clears throat> Praise God. Maybe we do a part two to, to Spirit of the Spirit. All right, this is what I want to get to. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter four. This is a popular scripture. Again, we're talking about the word of God being a sword. In Hebrews chapter four, in verse 12, it says the word of God that speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, pen penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul, and the immortal spirit, and of joints and marrow, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of your heart. And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The Bible says the word of God is a two-edged sword. And I don't have time to get into it, but there's different types of swords. I don't know if you knew that, right? There are swords that are only sharp on one side or on one edge. There are swords like this one. This one's actually dull, so it's not actually sharp. But it's sharp on both sides. And it's so sharp that it, when the edges meet, it comes to a point, right? Um, and the Bible says that the word of God is a two-edged sword. And I wanted to explain to you what that means because I think it's amazing. This is from Rick Renner. He says, the Machaira sword was sharp on both sides of its murderous blade. And because the blade of this special sword was sharpened on both sides, it made deeper gashes and wounds than, a dip, than the other swords. It was also terribly sharp and pointed at the tip. Hence, if the soldier wrenched the blade just right inside of his op opponent's stomach, it would pull the man's entrails out of his body when the sword was withdrawn. When a soldier used this deadly two-edged sword correctly, it always left the enemy lying on the ground in a puddle of his own blood, a position that guaranteed he would never bother that soldier again. Now the Holy Spirit tells us that the word of God is just like that. It is a sword that has two edges, cutting both ways and doing terrible damage to an aggressor. One sharpened edge of the sword, listen to this, one sharpened edge of the sword came into being when the word of God was initially, when the word of God initially proceeded from the mouth of God. The second edge of this sword is added when the word of God proceeds out of your mouth. Amen. Listen, the, the Greek word, I, I don't have time to get into it, but the Greek word used for, for double-edged or two, a two-edged sword is the word uh, dystomos, which literally means two mouths. So what Rick Renner is saying here is that a two-edged sword means that first, one side of the blade, it came out of God's mouth, and the second side of the blade, it came out of your mouth. 
And I heard Brother Copeland say this. He said, God's word in your mouth is just as powerful as God's word in his mouth. When you are saying the same thing as God, when you are saying the same thing as his word, when you are wielding correctly the sword of the spirit, it is able to penetrate darkness. It is able to penetrate deception. It is able to penetrate anxiety. It is able to penetrate depression. It is able to penetrate lack. It is able to penetrate the darkest, the darkest uh, heart, the most hardened heart, the, the sword of the spirit. When God's word is in your mouth, when that word of light, when that word of power, when that anointed word of God is in you flowing out of your spirit, it does so much damage to the enemy. If you could see the words coming out, out of my mouth right now in the spirit, you'd see beams of light shooting from my mouth right now. Because when the word of God is preached and when the word of God is spoken and when the word of God comes up on the inside of you, the enemy has to flee. Jesus, you want to know when Jesus used the sword of the spirit? Mark chapter four, he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and he's been fasting for 40 days. Some of you can't comprehend fasting 40 minutes, but Jesus was fasting for 40 days. He was hungry, he was weak. The enemy comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, you should just, doesn't some nice hot bread sound real good right now with some oil and some butter? Just, mm, doesn't that sound so good? Turn that rock into a loaf of bread. And what does Jesus say? He says, it is is written. And he quotes a, a, a passage from the book of Deuteronomy. How did Jesus know that verse from Deuteronomy? Because he hid the word in his heart. And in a moment of, of temptation, in a moment when he had to fight, in a moment when he had to stand up against literally Satan himself, what came out of Jesus was the word of God. Amen. Then again, Satan tempts Jesus again. And this time, Satan does a mind trick on Jesus because the devil operates through deception. Remember how I've been teaching you that, right? So this time, instead of just trying to tempt Jesus, the devil says, Jesus, don't you know the Bible says? And the devil quotes scripture to Jesus. But you know what? Jesus had the word of God so firmly planted on the inside of him, so firmly established in his heart that he wasn't swayed or tricked by the devil when the devil start, quote, started quoting scripture. Because again, what did Jesus say to the devil? He said, it is written. He quotes another passage of scripture from the book of Deuteronomy. How did Jesus know that passage of scripture from the Deuteronomy? Because he had studied the word, because it was already on the inside of him. And what does the Bible say? I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do you want to know how to stand up against the devil? Do you want to know how to use your sword of the spirit? Do you want to know how to drive the enemy out? Do you want to know how to use the light that's in you to overcome the darkness? You speak the word. When you're in the face of a, di a medical diagnosis that's in inconsistent with the word of God, you speak the word. When you're in the face of somebody who's telling you God's not real and they have all their philosophical, hermeneutical, theological reasons why, and you feel like they've outsmarted you. What do you do? You speak the word. When you're standing in a moment where you're tempted to sin, where you're tempted to cuss, where you're tempted to be rude to somebody, when you're tempted to do something stupid, what do you do? You speak the word. And when you speak the word, the Bible literally says, uh, scrolling to the last page of my outline, the Bible literally says, then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And you know what verse 11 says, the very next verse? It says, then the devil left him. Because when Jesus used the word, the devil had to flee. When Jesus released light into the situation, darkness could no longer remain there. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know what, you wanna know how you resist the devil? You resist the devil with your words. It's a fight of your words. It's a fight of your words. It is a word fight. Faith is released through the spoken word of God. If you don't know Mark chapter 11, 23 and 24, I don't wanna be your youth pastor because uh, I've probably preached that scripture and you should know that scripture like in your sleep. But what did Jesus say? He said, have faith in God. For surely I tell you, whoever says to a mountain, he doesn't say whoever hopes the mountain moves. Whoever crosses their finger and wishes secretly inside that the mountain leaves. Jesus said, when you say to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe only that those things which you've said will come to pass, then you will have whatever you say. 
It is a fight of your words. And if you wanna know how to stand up and fight a fight, what, regardless of what you are facing, you have to speak the word. You have to use the sword of the spirit. Amen. Hey, what's up, 1440? I hope you were blessed by the word that you just heard. Uh, we just give a shout out to the pastors for preaching that. And if what you heard today stirred something in your heart and you say, you know what? I need to get right with Jesus. I need to give my life over to the Lord. This is the time. Now is the time. So listen, if you're ready, pray this prayer with me. Father God, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Father, send your son, send your spirit, send your presence into my life. Take my life, do something with it for your son's name. Amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer for the first time, or if you're rededicating your life to Jesus, we want to know about it. Shoot us an email, 1440 at emic.org. Listen, Connect with us on our social media. We have Facebook, we have Instagram. We're there. Come and find us, come interact with us. And then you know what? Come visit us here in person at the Revival Capital of the World. Love to hear from you, love to see you. Remember, God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord.